good morning everybody good morning or afternoon wherever you are in the in the u.s um uh, my name is erica ricardo and i'm filling in for david filling today he couldn't join us so i'm just here uh to present uh, and well first of all thank you for joining us today uh in another webinar for this uh series that we've been doing and it's always a pleasure to have uh tony salas present uh, another webinar with lucas um well no, mr tony doesn't need any presentation you all know him so uh i'll leave you shortly with him i just uh would like to remind you if you have any questions or any comments please uh put you can leave them on the question uh questions and answer box on the bottom of your screen and at the end we'll go back to those questions and answer them and any other comments also if you have any suggestions or any topics you would like to see in any webinar feel free to comment or tell us uh as we are working in a, a series that we'll be doing for each month and throughout the whole few months uh that so far so without more comments or anything else i'll leave mr tony to to start uh on this topic for today thank you thank you very much erica thank you very much uh, once again, we'd like to thank uh, Lucas for actually sponsoring this webinar. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, very sensitive topic, but before I get started, let me tell you, as a training provider, one of the hardest classes to sell is electrical. This has been an oldie, but a goodie, but it's true. Again, as a training provider and many other training providers, one of the hardest classes to sell is actually electrical, but the most needed is Click on the chat window if you actually agree. So therefore, definitely put that in there because, again, as um, traveling and also teaching all over and we do diagnostic classes and so on, it's always a challenge about getting people to understand and know electrical and electrical principles. So, you know, the number actually reflects it. Hopefully, the number attending will go up. But in this case, a lot of guys feel they don't need it. They don't need to have it. But I got to tell you, when I go out there, you know, the different shops, you know, even something as frivolous as a relay and understanding some principles. So we're going to talk about what is electricity and apply some of these basic stuff. We have talked about diagnostics in the past about, you know, what sensors and uh, diagnostics and common rail and the turbo intakes and so on. But in this case, you know, time, we're going through an evolution or time change. And if you're one of those diesel guys that actually wants to fight the current technology and just bash a ev technology go ahead but the thing is it's happening you know and in this case i'm not saying and let's quote here correctly i'm not saying that ev is going to replace these so it's just going to go side by side but it's not going to replace it even though the threat seems to be there but again our power grids and so on technology is not quite there so don't worry diesel is going to be around for quite a while so with that said um, you know, you need to be up at speed on what is electrical. And if you look at a truck nowadays, a light duty truck, what is equipped now in a truck? I mean, you got, well, let, let me rephrase the question. Actually, what is not computer controlled or electronic control nowadays on a truck? Okay. Steering, brakes, analog brakes, uh, fuel system engine. I mean, there's no more cable that goes between your throttle uh, all the way to the injection pump anymore, right? It's all throttled by wires we said back in the early days so therefore everything's electronically controlled and we use our scan tools and we use hopefully use our meters but in this case sometimes we get aftermarket you know i visited a shop in california and they were having issues with you know they put an alarm system on the truck and now the truck wouldn't start correctly and issues in it because they put something aftermarket so when we do diagnosis, we kind of follow what General Motors used to say on one of their first steps of uh, really in-depth diagnosis was remove or disconnect any aftermarket accessories, you know, because that can actually influence such as alarm systems and so on. And everybody wants to put a remote start on their truck too as well. And that can cause havoc if it's not, not done correctly. So therefore we got to know what, what, how electricity works and what's going out there. And as I visited many shops these past month and a half, two months, I got to tell you, you, the guys admitted as, you know, because I took my training boards with me and it was amazing how many guys were just saying, well, I just don't understand that. And then I did classes for instructors only. And the instructors themselves also struggled. They said, oh yeah, we do this and do that. And then when I was teaching some basics of the electrical fundamentals, you know, it was, they were struggling with that. So with that said, 
Um, let's get into it. We got all, so much time to do this. And again, if you got any questions, type it in on the chat. We'll try to make this as, uh, you know, as interesting as possible. But in this case, electrical, a lot of guys, you start talking about electrical, you start talking about Ohm's law, power formula, and boom, shut off. You know, they shut it off. Oh, no, I don't want to deal with this. But before we answer, you know, what is electricity? Why do we know, need to know this? And the bottom line is for your diagnosis. You got to know what your diagnosis is. So if you have a meter like I have here before me, you know, you know, I have fluke meters and so on. And in this case, you're going to use that meter for testing different circuits, even as something as frivolous as your starting and charging systems. So you got to understand issues or malfunctions that you can, a technician can pretty much see in a shop, you know. So again, it goes back to that saying once again, not to bore you, but is that isn't it fun to work on something when you know how it works? So in this case, use electrical concepts to know and understand why those issues occur. So you should, you should know. And I put that in caps. You should know how it works. So those of you that have attended today, thank you. Because in this case, you need to know this. And if you know it already, let this be a refresher. But the bottom line is we have to understand a lot of these concepts of what we're trying to do and to diagnose and see what's going on. Because again, you know, when we look at electricity, if you were actually, you know, look it up in a search engine such as Google and you say, hey, what is electricity? It'll be something along the lines of something of movement of electrons. So when we teach electrical one, you know, it's kind of frustrating. Some programs that I've seen, they bypass the whole movement of electron stuff and they just readily get into voltage. They get into amperage and they get into resistance. But in this case, if I'm going to teach you EL2 in the electrical stage two class, I got to get into transistors and diodes and I got to know or you have to know what the electrons are all about there so you can understand how a transistor such as a bipolar transistor or a diode works as well. So then we get into Zener diodes and so on. So therefore we have to know that but we're not going to go too much in depth but we've got to touch in that discussion. Let's first review how it applies. In other words, batteries, you know. Time and time again, batteries have been an issue. How does it work? The generator, you'll notice that we no longer say alternator because it's a generator. Its output is DC, not AC. So in this case, even to the day, I ask guys, all right, we got an alternator right here. So here you can see I got my old SI alternator right here. In this case, I ask them, do you understand what's going on inside of here? Do you understand how this works? So in this case, you know, I would say that 90% of techs that I've pretty much have talked to, they just don't understand that. You know, when I do classes in Mexico, it's amazing how these in Mexico, they don't replace a lot of stuff. They fix the current stuff. And it's amazing how they will repair, you know, such things as starters and alternators as well and other uh, components as well. And then we get into voltage drop testing, you know, how to use it and how it aids in diagnosis. You know, how many times have we done a starter? Uh, no, it does not operate. And a novice or apprentice or a guy that doesn't have any type of electrical training you know, he's trying to fix the starting problem or the starter problem. And the thing is he, well, the battery must be low, replaces the battery. Oh, starter was bad, replace the starter. And then finally they get to the cables and they say, it's gotta be the cables. Turns out it might be a high resistance ground or a connection, you know, loose connection. So with that, you know, we have to understand voltage drop testing because NREL1, the first day pretty much encompasses voltage drop testing and we do voltage drop again voltage drop again voltage drop again it's the it's the repetitive action to actually learn what you're trying to accomplish by doing a voltage drop test but then we have to understand circuits i mean we can look at wiring diagrams and in this case we have to know what's going on with circuits parallel versus series and by the way before i you know as i was talking about traveling visiting shops there were a lot of great technicians that knew their stuff too don't get me wrong and they actually really impressed me how well some of them learned and know how these uh, circuits are all put together on a vehicle, such as a diesel truck, right? And then the use of the wiring diagrams themselves. I still had quite a few guys lost in the use of the wiring diagrams. So in this case, we got to get fluent in those and understand how they work. Unfortunately, since I use a service provider that uses all the different OE, such as Ford, General Motors, and Ram Dodge, and other makes such as VW, you know, we actually can see that the wiring diagrams from each manufacturer are not all consistently the same. They're all different. So we have to understand how they're set up and how they work. And then I could use the DTCs, right? Diagnostic trouble codes, circuit high, circuit low, you know, circuit performance and so on. You're going to get codes. So therefore the onboard computer does some of your homework for you. But let's not get too carried away. We said that electricity is the movement of electrons and they're part of an atom. 
But the thing is, we actually measure those electrons moving through there through an amp. When we look at an amp and you're measuring amps, for example, I got this meter right here and this meter at the bottom right here actually has a maximum of 10 amps it can measure. So therefore these meters can only measure no more than 10 amps. However, if I get an inductive adapter like I have here as well, here you can see my inductive adapter. It's a clamp style, you know, so it's conductive and actually has leads that connect to the meter. And what it does, it allows me to actually measure, right, right, from these leads right here. You can see the leads. And in this case, we can measure any currents above, you know, 200 amps, 300 amps, 4 amps. So I could do a starter draw test. I can check generator, alternator, output of the, uh, on the back cable coming out of it. So therefore, what am I looking at when I measure amperage? That is a number of electrons. And in theory, they're talking about that 6.24 times 10 to the 18th power, which is 6.24 times, which is 6.24 billion billion electrons moving through a wire in one amp. So therefore, that's how many electrons are moving through there. You know, and that's in other words, it's a lot of current moving through there. And what is that current? That is the electrons that are moving through that wire. So as we look at a wire, you know, we can say, hey, there's so much electrons moving through there. But for us in everyday understanding, we're using the amp. In other words, measuring the amps. So therefore, we need amps to flow. And like I've said before in previous electrical presentations, the classic way I can make you understand the difference between voltage and amperage has been the fuse box. When you look at a fuse box, you look at the fuses and all the fuses have always been different. You know, you can look at this picture right here. That's right here. And you'll notice 15 amps, 40 amps, 20 amps, seven and a half amps, and so on. That's telling you that those perspective circuits work with different amount of amperage. But as you can see right there on the bottom of it, it they all work with 12, 12.6 volts of standard battery voltage. So they all work with the same voltage. But in this case, the amperage varies in circuits. So imagine a big starter motor versus a little light bulb, right? So therefore, one uses more amperage than the other. So therefore, their fuses are going to be different. But then later on, as we will discuss, there's relays involved too. And relays are now becoming a problem. And hear me good, because we're seeing more and more relay failure causing intermittent or drivability issues. Because how old is a truck nowadays? For example, like a Duramax, you know, LLY, it's a 2005 and it's 2023 right now. How old is that relay nowadays? And is it going to cause issues? So therefore, amperage is a main player of what makes things work, you know, and in this case, we need amperage to make a starter work, we need amperage to actually make the light, lights turn on and everything turns on. And if you've been kind of stuck in your shop and you haven't seen new technology, you know, I don't know if you've seen a new 2022-23 truck. Nowadays, most vehicles are now becoming all big LCD screens on the dash, you know. And in this case, you got to understand that everything is going to require power for it to work. So therefore, the power distribution is amazing. So with that said, please understand that amperage is what's moving through the wires, whether it being a big, thick cable or a thin wire, you know, it's all got amperage flowing through it to make things work. But in this case, where's our source? It's got to come from the battery, right? So therefore, the battery is the main player here. So therefore, We've talked about connections. We've talked about making sure they're tight. And time and time and time again, when I go to shops, you see these battery terminals are all heavily corroded and nobody seems to give that importance. The more electrical, the more electronics, guess what? We're actually going to be needing more power from those batteries. I mean, think about what a glow plug actually consumes now. Like it, actions, it happens in fractions of a second, but still it's pulling some serious amperage that it's pulling there from the batteries in order to get the truck started. So with that said, you know, we have to understand that the battery is a key component. We have to understand that that battery has got to be properly charged, but do we understand even the charging? You know, a very classic question I ask in my classes is that, how do you charge a battery? Low, trickle, low or high? You know, and you're gonna see that many people still don't understand there are now smart chargers out there and those smart chargers start low then high then low then high and then monitors the battery charging but nobody bothers to read that owner's manual that comes with today's battery chargers that are now more expensive but they're a lot smarter to charge those batteries but we have to understand that the battery creates that through a chemical reaction yes there are lithium batteries out there there is glass mats you know there's all that kind of stuff out there even the, still the optima spiral bound batteries but the lead acid battery doesn't seem to go away, does it? It's still here, it's still around. 
So in this case, you got to understand what's going on inside the battery. But if we were to ask you simple questions like, number one is, how does a battery make electricity? It's through a chemical reaction, two unlike metals and a bit of acid. And then we have the three types of creating of electricity. There's chemical, which is a battery. There's induction, which is through an alternator generator. And then there's friction, you know, like in static electricity when you walk across a carpet. Now, I'm going to take myself out of stock. I'm going to go to full. I should be able to go to full screen here. Can we put me on full screen there, guys, or can we not? I want to show something real quick. I don't know if she can or not. If not, I'll go back to the regular screen and I'll go back to here. Nope. Okay, we can't. Then let me do this. All right. Well, let me just show you this here. Um, what I was going to try to do is that as I look at an alternator generator right here, okay? As you look at an alternator generator, I'm going to pull this puppy apart here. And as I pull it apart, we're going to look at this guy right here. So therefore, let me throw it in front of the camera. There we go. So there, this is our, uh, this is actually two units in one. If you've never understood inside of it, and the reason why I like this SI is because back in the day, by the way, this is 1974, 75 technology. So if you're complaining about what you don't know or know, you know, you got to understand that. So in this case here, we could see an alternator generator. So in this case, I'm going to pull these part, uh, guys a little bit apart. Hopefully it'll allow me to. And I had it apart early just to make sure this doesn't happen. But in this case, what we're going to see right here is uh, we're going to see three legs right here. And I'm not sure if you can see that, but there's three legs right about right here. One, two, three. Those are three phases. This is the stator that goes around. And in the center, we actually have a rotating rotor. So therefore, that is another coil in itself. So therefore, that's the coil that rotates. Now, the contacts for that coil, let me get this closer to the camera. Whoop you're going to see two slip rings. So therefore, there we go, one and two right there. So therefore, you can see two. So therefore, that's where the brushes run on. And those brushes, all they do is provide power and ground. That's what we call the field current. So therefore, that field current is, again, a rotating electromagnet, which we call the rotor. So therefore, when you actually add power and ground to those slip rings, that's it's rotating, it's powered up. That means that it's actually becoming an electromagnet meaning that it becomes magnetized. So therefore, that field current rotates, again, inside of this guy outside here, which is the stator, which I told you has three phases right now, which I showed you already. So therefore, we can see that right there. So therefore, one of the basic concepts we've got to understand is that we're inducing. What is to induce? Meaning that this magnetic field that's rotating is inducing voltage coming out of these three terminals. Okay. So therefore, when we talk about field current, once again, that is a rotating rotor. The brushes are providing power and ground going to it. I kind of miss the old days, I got to tell you, because it was pretty easy to diagnose that because back in the day, we can actually get to the back of this generator. And right here, there's going to be a little kind of a, we called it the D shape, but it's an oval hole right here. And what we were able to do is we were able to, where's that hole? Here it is. I'm trying to make sure you can see it. So this camera right here. But what happened there, we were supposed to actually go ahead and stick a screwdriver in there. We can actually ground the brush. So if the regular wasn't grounding and turning on the field current, because it already already had positive potential going to it, needed negative, we just simply stuck a screwdriver in there and we grounded it. And if it started charging, that means that you know your regulator was bad and you could replace it on these old dogs here. As a matter of fact, they still sell the kits for them. But anyways, interesting. But that's what we call induction. We have a rotating rotor actually, again, inducing voltage, but it's AC in nature. But we'll get into that later bit, okay? I'm just teasing you a little bit, getting you started with that. So therefore, we'll definitely go, in, go into it more. Now, then we got voltage drop, right? We got voltage drop testing and classes like this. Here's a class that I did over at uh, Matthew's place over at Diesel Systems. You can see we covered a lot about the uh, voltage drop and the purpose of voltage drop was actually to um, find unwanted or wanted resistance, but in this case, mostly unwanted resistance. Here, let me give you a challenge here. We just talked about the generator alternator, right? What's the classic voltage drop test we want you to do? Well, right in the back, right there, let me go this way. You're gonna see the stud right there. See that stud? That stud with the nut, that is your bat terminal. Well, in this case, we chart, we tell you to do a voltage drop test on this bat terminal to see what's going on. And how do you do it? You fire up the engine, Obviously, you need to have access to this bat terminal, so make sure you get access or put a clip, whatever you got, have to want it. And then at that point, we tell you to fire up the truck and go ahead and get it all nicely uh, 
you know, turn on all the loads as you can, lower motor on high, high beams, windshield wipers on, everything you can turn on, right? And in this case, we tell you to go to that bat terminal right here. Oop. We go to the bat terminal. We want you to go from here to the positive battery terminal. And in this case, what you're trying to do is, are you trying to figure out, is there any unwanted resistance between the bat terminal of the alternator generator and the positive post. So that means there must be a connection that runs from that alternator generator all the way to the positive terminal of the battery, because some of you know it and probably say that it charges the battery. Yes, that's correct. So therefore we're trying to find unwanted resistance. Now, in many cases on some smaller vehicles, we find that there is up to more than half a volt of drop there. And that tells us that the cable itself is overwhelmed, meaning that it's not the correct gauge. So one of the best modifications that I've been teaching for years about doing is go ahead and put another battery cable. We buy a dual eyelid cable and we actually put it from the bat terminal to the positive terminal of the battery to give current another path to flow because that cable might be small. If you don't believe me, look at a Duramax LB7LY. You're going to notice, look at the gauge size wire coming out of those generators, alternators themselves. But again, we're just trying to find unwanted resistance. So we talk about unwanted resistance because, you know, one of the things that I had many guys tell me about their diagnosis has been, you know, we had to check power and ground going to the computer. I go, yeah, you could have done a voltage drop test. But then a lot of guys don't understand that when you do a voltage drop test, the circuit must be on. Like I just told you about the alternator right now, generator. I told you go from the bat terminal to the positive posts. Well, you do that with the engine running and system charging and all the loads on. So therefore, in other words, you check the circuits when they're on. So that's where we get that term static versus dynamic testing, which you're supposed to do. Since summer's coming, it's getting nice and hot. And for those of you out there in those states that are getting hot, believe it or not, we're barely hitting 90 something today. But the thing is, we, we're getting into AC compressor season, right? So therefore, we're doing AC work. I just did an AC service, two AC services yesterday. And in this case, we're talking about AC, a air compressor. Well, here you can see on this diagram here, we're gonna notice that we see a relay there. We are talking about relays earlier. There's your coil side of the relay and there's your switch side of the relay. Well, the one thing that we tell guys to do is that, well, you know, if your AC compressor clutch or the AC compressor seized, how many to you have actually put a voltmeter between the coil of the compressor clutch? Meaning that, we need to get to that here. They're calling it uh, pin number one, pin number two, because it's a two pin connector. And in this case, we're going to ask you, go ahead and put volt, measure voltage drop across that AC clutch. It should match close to what battery voltage is. Some books say 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. I'll stretch it to 0.4, but uh, that's kind of, to me, that's a lot of voltage drop. Some people might disagree. But in this case, you know, if you've got 13 volts at the battery and the chart, you know, system's charging, you do ahead and you go ahead and do a voltage drop across the AC clutch. So obviously you do it with the engine running. Once again, the AC turned on, the clutch engaged. And what you should do is measure what is the voltage across that AC clutch coil. So in this case, there's a connector going there. And what you're simply going to do is you're going to see if it's close to source voltage or your battery voltage. Obviously, you're going to see what the charging system voltage is. And then you're going to measure across the AC clutch because you'd be surprised how there could be more than one volt, 0. 0.5 to 1, 2, 3 volts, you know? So who's the guy that might be the problem? Well, it could be a bad ground. So if we look at the diagram here, there's G108. It could be a bad ground. In other words, a ground with a high resistance. Or it could also be, the more common thing is, the actual switch side of the relay. So when you look at the switch side of that relay, those relay contacts have been opening, and closing, opening, and closing. And in this case, so that means that there could be high resistance in that switch. That's why I'm telling you that we could also do a voltage drop test. You know, like the guys, I had them do some voltage drop tests on this class I just taught. And I said, just move upward, just upward a little bit that AC relay and go ahead and put your skinny leads. I mean, really thin leads such as, you know, you could use, um, uh, so, you know, test pins and so on. And let's do a voltage drop across three and five right there of the clutch relay to see if those contacts have high resistance. So if I got two volts across three and five right here, that's telling me I got high resistance at that relay. But you can always just do it at the compressor clutch coil. But remember, if you have too much voltage drop above 0.4, in other words, 0.4 and a half, 
0 0.5, 0 0.6, and so on. That's telling you that you got something that's actually impeding the voltage. You're losing voltage, which in turn is telling you you got one wanted resistance, so we're losing amperes. So what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that the clutch is not getting enough voltage, so therefore the amperage is low because there's resistance in the circuit, and that clutch is going to start to what? Slip. And that slipping is going to cause a lot of friction, and that friction is going to cause that front bearing to get hot and seize, and eventually that compressor locks up. So I hate it when I see guys saying, well, this is the second compressor we put on it. Well, idiot, did you actually go ahead and do a voltage drop test? Because that really agitates me. Because they complain about parts, but sometimes it ain't the parts, guys. It's actually that you just don't do your voltage drop testing across that AC compressor clutch. So therefore, you definitely want to do that. Okay. All right, I'm over it. But uh, please note, another trivia question I can ask you is, what is the purpose of the clutch diode, right? So when we look at a clutch diode, that is actually to suppress the high voltage spikes generated by the induced voltage when that compressor is turned off. So in the past, they used to be external. Most of them are now internal on compressors, so no worries. But in this case, please note, there is a compressor clutch diode that is pretty much on most compressors nowadays are all internal in the connector themselves. So therefore, if you're working with like with an old R4 compressor, you know, the old pancake GM style compressor, those had them, ex those had them externally. So therefore, that's what we see there. All right. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the circuit also, oh, by the way, let me backtrack. Hold on. Here you can see that there's also the switch side of the relay. So when I go over here, we're going to see that once again in the relay, there's the switch side and then there's the coil side. Okay, other AKA known as the control side and again, the high current side. So this controls that contacts on the relay. But we'll get into relays later on as we move ahead here. So, so what are we trying to say? Well, as you see right there, I just did this real quickly for you. Again, you want to get to that compressor, make adapters, whatever you got to do. And what you want to do is probe and measure that there is adequate voltage drop across that compressor, again, when it's turned on and engaged. So again, you do voltage drops with circuits on. I say that again. So what you're looking for is what the voltage drop there. Now, if I see 12 and a half like the meter shows, that's a big no-no. That means that we got, <laughs> or excuse me, that is not a big no-no. I take that back. We want to see voltage to be matching that of battery voltage. So in this case, if source is 12 and a half, then that would be great. But then obviously the harness connector and all that is missing. But what I'm just trying to show you there is simple as going across the connector and see if we have our source voltage going there. That's a great test you can do right across, right, right across it. So therefore, again, if you got a seize compressor, always do that voltage drop across it. So there you go. So when we talk about the principles of what is electricity, you know, we talk about voltage, amperage, and resistance, but a lot of us still don't grasp the concept of what we're looking at. Voltage is pressure. That's all it is. It's the pressure that's actually being applied to a circuit. And like you saw in the fuse box, what, are make, what makes things work is amperage and current, right? So in this case, that's what we see going on there. We saw the different fuses and stuff, and then we got resistance. So as we just talked about that AC compressor clutch, that coil has resistance, right? And that coil is going to have some resistance in it, and therefore we got to make sure that resistance is not too high or not too low. It should be very minimal, but in this case, it's almost next to nothing, but there is some kind of resistance in everything that we see from your light bulbs and now to your LED circuits and so on. Everything has to have some kind of resistance on it. But for now, your job is to understand what is voltage. It's just the pressure. So if you put your voltmeter across a battery, is that going to tell you if that battery is fully charged? No. Back in the day, we used a load tester where we actually did half the CCA value for 15 seconds, and it shouldn't drop under 9.6 volts at ideal temperatures, right? And then we got your other testers nowadays, which are capacitance-style testers that actually will now take the CCA, and they'll tell you if there's something wrong with the battery. But in this case, we still got to verify that we get adequate voltage, but the best way is to go ahead and do a capacitance test or a load test on the battery to know if it's a good battery or not, because just measuring voltage is not going to cut it. You got to make sure what's going on. Now, as we talk about EV technology, right, we got a Model 3 Tesla now in the family, and that one's been a good teach. But one of the things we're understanding is that EV, you know, you got high voltages and stuff, but you also need to understand that there's some serious amperage that is being used as well. 
So in this case, that amperage far exceeds what we see. And we're talking about, you know, in excess of, you know, over 50 amps in many cases. So therefore, we're talking about some serious amperage. So yeah, I'm still learning DVs. Don't get me wrong. Tony's been involved with diesels, but he's catching on to the EV stuff. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, amperage is going to require you to be safe because amperage is the killer. So therefore, you're going to have to have the adequate voltage, but you also need to have the adequate amperage. How can I demonstrate that? Well, when you look at a Duramax LML, that's a piezo common rail system. And you're going to see that General Motors actually wraps the cables on that injector with orange wrap, orange accordion wrap. You know, that orange style, that's orange color. And what they do is they're trying to indicate to you that's a high voltage, high current. So therefore, be cautious, especially those of you that want to do the wiggle test. So on the LML Duramax and the its companion, it also, in other words, what's the LML and the L, LFD, L5D, I forget already. Sorry, so many L's that I got to remember. But in this case, the ones that correlated in, with the LML, the cab chassis cutaway engine. So therefore, what I'm trying to say is that they are using piezo common rail injection. I know what you're thinking. Hey, Tony, uh, Power Stroke 67 uses the same system. You're right, the same Bosch piezo, but they didn't opt to do that. So General Motors just wanted you to be cautious and aware that there is high current and high voltage going to those injectors. So therefore, the Ohm's Law. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into Ohm's Law in this session. I've got enough time. But in this case, with Ohm's Law, what we're trying to teach you is that there's a relationship between voltage, amperage, and resistance. And a lot of my students that have gone through my EL1, EL2 classes, I'm so proud of them because when I see them doing aftermarket installs or modifications to wiring system, man, they're sitting there with Ohm's Law and they get it. Because if you're going to have so much amperage in a circuit, right, you need to have the correct gauge wire. So in this case, wire gauges are going to be different. So therefore, that's going to be a big issue. You know, I've been talking about this story for the longest time about the 6.5, but it kind of demonstrates how guys still don't do voltage drop testing. If you look at a, those of you who've never seen this, that's why most of you haven't. Uh, we talked about the 6.5 PMD issue. The, You know, in this case, you know, the, the driver circuit for that. Well, let me just show it right here. When you look closely right here, you're going to see that on the back of this pump, there's this big fat solenoid right there, right? And what drives that big fat solenoid is this module right here, better known as a PMD. So many guys talk about, now there's many other issues wrong with it, but in this case, it kind of reminded me back in the day when I wrote this bulletin, if you like a copy of this bulletin, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. But what it was simply is that if you have PMD failure, you know, you actually need to do a voltage drop test going to that pink and black wire, as you, as you can see from the voltmeter. So in bulletin, I'm telling you to do a series of measurements. And what you need to do is go from positive battery to the ignition voltage. And then you got your ground circuit. Here you can see that big fat cylinder that draws a lot of amperage. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because one thing we talk about also in what is electricity is power, which is wattage. If you ever looked at your electric bill or you ever look at generators, everything is in power. What is the power formula? It's simply that the intensity times the voltage, meaning the amperage times the voltage. So therefore, E is also voltage. I forgot to mention that. And that's why, again, we try to encourage you to take electrical. So therefore, what we're saying is that we want you to understand that there is wattage. Well, let's just apply it based on what we see there. You know, when you look at this type of solenoid, and I just put some numbers in there so you could understand, because again, wattage is what's power that this solenoid is going to require for it to work. So therefore, if we have 12 volts, for example, and it draws 10 amps, right? 12 times 10 is what? 120. So if the, we know that this solenoid, by using the watts formula, is going to draw, again, 120 watts. So if the voltage drops, right, let's say under cranking, you've got already low voltage and you crank and it drops to six volts under cranking. What is now the amperage going to that cylinder that's required for it to do that work of 120 watts? Well, if 12 times 10 is 10 amps, therefore six times what? 20. So therefore the amperage is doubled. So that would mean that PMD or that pump mounted driver that little driver, that little module is now going to see double the amperage that it's supposed to see. Therefore, it trips. So in this case, therefore, the truck will not start. No power, nothing going to that solenoid to control, again, your pressure and your operation of each mechanical injector. So I guess what I'm trying to say is 
we need to understand how important voltage drop is. That's why I said earlier that we need to do a voltage drop test because if voltage drops too low, right in the circuit, even while it's running, okay, we need to understand that, you know, hey, that's going to draw more amperage because that solenoid is going to draw more amperage because of the fact that it's got less voltage applied to it. So your job, once again, is to, again, verify that voltage drop is correct. Are we dropping any voltage? It should be source. So, hey, this guy's supposed to work with battery voltage. That's what we should have. You want to say charging voltage? That's still the same. So if the truck is running and it's running at 13.2, guess what I should ideally have at that peak and black terminal D right there of the PMD? I should see 13.2. Now we give you again less than a half a volt slack there. So in this case, if it's you know take away third, you know 0 0.3, 0 0.4 off of it, you can be as low as at, you know 12.9. But in this case, ideally you should be close to 13.2 because that's telling you there's no resistance in the circuit. Now on some of these 96 Chevy Silverado models, 96, 97s, if my memory serves me correct, they used actually a um, what do you call it a uh, uh, fusible link. And that fusible link actually was the problem right there. It was causing high resistance. So what we do is we install a relay in that circuit to get rid of the fusible link, run straight battery power through a fuse straight to that pink and black terminal D right there that you can see on the, on the pump-mounted driver. So anything, any module that's out there, whether it be in a PMD or anything else, should have battery power. So we do a voltage drop test with it turned on. Again, dynamically testing things. But what we're just trying to introduce you real quickly is that that power formula is telling you that, hey, a solenoid, a motor, this applies to solenoids and motors only. You know, those, gonna, those are going to draw so much wattage of power. They're going to pull power. So in this case, if the voltage is low, the pressure is low, it's going to draw more current. So it's going to overwhelm that circuit and it's going to draw too many amps. So therefore, what burns a fuse? amperage right so in this case that can shut down a driver it can actually burn stuff so therefore pay attention to that so another thing you know is relays and guys i know some of you say oh i know relays. some of you don't but some of you do and that's a good thing you know i like the fact that when you buy even your generic relays from your local auto parts stores 90 percent of them have still diagrams on them and you could see the two different sides of the circuit right there there's 85 and 86 that is your control side and then there's 87 and 30 that is your normally open side and then 87 a to 30 that is your normally closed side so this is a normally open uh, relay but it also has the option of normally closed so right now it's normally closed at rest so in this case that's what we say it's a normally closed relay so technically yeah it's a normally closed relay but we need to do and understand uh, the testing of it so therefore we need to understand what relays do in this case we use them to control high current and low current circuits now to the day, I still see these guys calling me once in a while about a PO380 code. What is the PO380? Well, it's on a Duramax LB7, and it's actually a glow plug code. Now, this is a federal truck you're looking at right here. Now, as you look at this federal truck, because it was a California model, by the way, you're going to look closely. Let me zoom this up. Well, what we're, what we're going to see here is there's our relay right there. There's the glow plug. There's that fusible link right there. So there's a problem right off the bat because we can see voltage drops. But since there was enough current available, it still worked, you know, because of the fact that it wasn't critical. These glow plugs still will pull their current. Now, when this relay closes, you're going to notice that it supplies power to all the glow plugs. So it's a pretty beefy relay to handle all that current, right? Now, on the other side, though, there is the coil side. Now, you're probably asking yourself, okay, how does the computer know if there's a problem with this glow plug relay? Well, you'll notice right here, there is a splice right here that goes to another fusible link, and that's circuit 506, which goes down to <coughs> your glow plug signal. There is terminal 52 connector one right there. So in this case, what we're saying is, well, how did it set the code for that glow plug? Well, there you go. It's actually doing it through this wire right here, which we call the glow plug signal going over to the ECM. Hopefully you can all see this. All right. So the thing is, a lot of guys would go ahead and replace the whole relay. And guess what? That was not the problem. Some of them actually would actually put a big mega fuse and replace the fusible link. That was not the problem either. On the contrary, you shouldn't have done that. But in this case, on the control side of the relay, 
you're supposed to do a voltage drop test. Turns out that the common problem on these Duramaxes is the fact that the ground, G104, which is located on the side of the block there on the passenger side, along with other wires, and in this case, that actually has high resistance from the road debris and so on through time. So therefore, we tell you to put your voltmeter across these two right here. So therefore, you literally can take a voltmeter and make your adapters or take your probes, whatever, and you can measure across the two sides of the coil side or control side of the relay. So that would mean that if there was not enough voltage here, that means that this was actually what? not generating enough magnetic or electromagnetic field to keep that relay contact. So therefore, these, this relay contact was intermittently open and closing. So since it was intermittently open and closing, it would trip the signal wire going to the ECM, and the ECM would set the PL380 code. So in this case, one of the things we told you to do is, yes, you can do a voltage drop across the relay contact. Yes, you should have zero. But in this case, what should you have across the coil side? You should have battery voltage because that is the load in the circuit. So it's a series circuit going from the ECM. So here we can see the ECM on the top, providing power, positive potential. And the grounding was, well, like we showed you already, is at G104. So in this case, again, you do a voltage drop test. You put both leads of your meter across the coil side to see if you actually had a bad ground. Now, a lot of guys have cheated now. They just go down to the to the ground of the block, G104, they clean it up, take it loose, and they take a wire brush, clean it up, and that takes care of the code in many times. But given the fact this is a 2001 through 2003 truck, has that really been used up quite a lot, right? So that could be the problem too as well, meaning that the contacts could be worn, causing high resistance, inadequate voltage going to the glow plugs. So therefore, therefore, please understand that a relay coil side also needs to have the standard battery voltage or charging voltage going to it. That's why when you look at diagnosis, you're gonna notice they say measure BAT positive because BAT positive means battery positive terminal, right? Or battery voltage, excuse me. So in this case, what we're saying is you're supposed to always check your battery voltage while the engine is running because you're doing this dynamically. And in this case, you're gonna to check to see if it's actually got the correct voltage because obviously I know what you're saying. Well, Tony, the glow plugs mostly turn on when it's key on engine off, but yeah, but they do run for a few seconds after you fire up and you can do it then too as well. But know what your battery voltage is before you get started. So if you got 12.6, 12.8 at the battery, what should you have at that coil side? Close to 12.6, 12.8 at the battery. So it can vary. All right. So that was a common thing that we still see on these trucks as they move along. So therefore, as we talk about the things that work, you know, we just talked about the alternator generator earlier. Like I said before, we saw that rotating electromagnet. Very important to understand, right? But like I said before with this guy, there was those three terminals, right? One, two, three. Come on, finger. One, two, three, right there. I got to do reverse thing as I look at myself here. But that I said earlier that you got AC being induced out of those three terminals, right? So one of the things that I talk about in the AL2 class is, you know, how do we rectify DC or excuse me, AC to DC? And we actually, that's why, again, we have to talk about the movement of electrons because we understand that in a diode, there's the anode and there's the cathode side. And believe it or not, I make my guys tell me, they go on the board. I have this set up on the board. And I have to tell me how this works, you know? So you got, there's your stator right here. This is what we call a Y styled stator. There's deltas. Most trucks use deltas, by the way, not Y. But this is a standard Y type of stator. Yes, there are two types of stators that are being used. And again, if you didn't catch on what a stator is, that's this guy that's wrapped around the rotor. So therefore, there's the rotor once again, and there's this coils or wire around this. That is your stator. And they could be wired differently how they're connected together at the three phases. So in this case, there's the three phases right there. AC comes out of here. So at a given moment, there is positive. At a given moment, there's D, there's negative because AC is positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So at a given time, it's actually positive. Given time, it's negative. So we use these diodes that separate, if you want to say it that way, the positive from the negative. So I have guys actually review that if we're positive at a given time, we're reverse biased through the cathode side of this diode and we're four bias through this anode side then we're reverse bias and reverse bias to the cathode side of these diodes and we go to your battery this represents your battery your load 
So in this case, what we're just trying to say is, why do I need to know this? Well, you should know how it works, but that means that diodes, even to the day, can still leak, meaning that we can have AC induced into the system. That's why, you know, even our old battery testers, I don't know why we got rid of it, but you can still check it. You know, you're going to see that there could be AC leakage. So computers don't like AC guys, they don't. So if you got some leakage where a diode is breaking down, yeah, you're going to actually have some drivability issues. The transmission will shift erratically. The engine will rev up high and low. I mean, it'll do stuff that doesn't make sense. So one of the things we like to do is we literally disconnect the connector off of the generator alternator. And we just go ahead and see if the problem goes away. Because now you're running on battery power only. The generator alternator is no longer in play. So with that said... All I'm saying is we should know how these things work. And it agitates me that, you know, a guy wants to take on, I know this, I know that, but yet he can't tell me how the rectification circuit on a 19, what is it, 70 some technology, you know, that we're using to, and how it works, you know, so. Now, the next thing I wanted to mention is uh, lab scopes, okay, lab scopes. Now, you know, Jim Wilson, I got, if you go to my website, Jim Wilson's recording that, and Jim said already he wants to do another one. Thanks, Jim, by the way. But in this case, we got to understand that lab scopes are not as bad as you think they are. And just one thing I'm going to throw at you right off the bat is that, you know, you can see what electricity is doing, you know. And as we start to get to more in-depth drivability and more, we're carrying a lot. Because automotive, I got to be honest with you, a lot of automotive guys are ahead of us than us in the diesel side because of, uh, you know, they use scopes a lot and you could use scope to your benefit. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't use my scope a whole heck of a lot, but, you know, when I do, it comes in handy. So when you look at a lab scope, you're going to take a picture. You know, it's kind of like what a camera is. You know, when I took, um, you know, photography, I only good at black and white because I'm partially colorblind, but when I took photography, they said, what is photography? You know, you're capturing time. You're and that's what you're doing in a lab scope. You're literally freezing time for you to see what's going on. So therefore, you're looking at two main things. What are the two things you're measuring in the lab scope? And that is voltage and time. Voltage vertically and time base or your time horizontally. So in this case, you can see how much voltage the system works at. Let's say it's 12 volts. It's going to hold at 12 volts. You're going to see a steady line going across for 12 volts. If it's a 0 to 5 volt signal, you're going to see that voltage go up and down. You're going to see a nice little kind of like a hyperbola. You're going to see a little up and down thing going there. So in this case, what we're trying to say is that, you know, a, it allows you to see what electricity is doing. For example, I had a real crazy drivability problem with a Cummins 5.9. And it's, I looked at the fuel pressure sensor, the fuel rail pressure sensor, and it's a zero to five volt signal. Obviously, it, it's interpreted to read the actual rail pressure in the rail. Well, the thing is, this I, I said, there's got to be something going on. Even though on the scan tool, the fuel rail pressure readings were all, they, look, they looked awesome. I went ahead and put my scope on it. And it, actually, I'll, I'll confess, I did my meter first, and then I hooked up my scope. And in this case on the scope, what I did was I actually went ahead and watched, uh, you know, as I'm accelerating, raising and lowering the rail pressure. And then when it caused the drivability problem, I saw that the voltage, bam, slammed to zero, then came back up. Now a meter, it happens so fast that a meter won't catch, catch that. It's too fast. You might get it, but you might not. And in this case, I couldn't see that sudden drop to zero. You know, I'm holding at, I don't know what it was. I think it was like 13,000 uh, PSI of pressure. And all of a sudden just slammed. It's, but in this case, the computer reacted to it and caused my surge. But it wasn't displayed on the scan tool. So therefore, that's where a lab scope can shine because you can change your time set. You can watch one second of time, half a second of time, a quarter of a second. I mean, you could bring it down. Or you can look at five to 10 seconds of time. You know, I want to see five seconds of time, 10 seconds of time, whatever. You can see whatever time base you're allowed that, that the scope allows you to do, but it allows you to see that. So sure enough, when I saw it, I recorded it because I had a DSO, digital storage oscilloscope, where I can freeze it. I freezed it. And at that point, I could see it was a current in less than half a second, you know. So therefore, actually, it was less than half a second. But in this case, the meter did not catch it, but I was able to see it on the scope. So one of the things you got to get going is start playing with it. Now, 
nowadays, today's scopes, there's a lot of presets, depending what brand you have. They have presets on them. So they're already preset it for you. You can change the time and the voltage later, but it makes it easier for see what's going on. Now, I know that the biggest problem we're having right now is actually finding an ideal waveform. So you got to work with, you know, good waveforms, I guess what I'm trying to say. Now, let me stop this share for a minute. Let me go to a different share. And what I did was, is that on my computer, what I did was, if I get this correctly, oh, come on. Um, what I Googled, I don't know if it's coming up. Hold on. Let me put it up to this. I think I have it here. Um, there we go. Let me kill this. And what I did was I did a Google search. Let me get rid of this box here. Hold on. I got a box block in my view. So let me minimize this a little bit. Let me bring this down so I can view it. There it is. And what I did is I actually did a search. There it is right there. And what I did is I just did a search for you guys to encourage you what's out there. Because the biggest excuse that I get a lot of guys that tell me is like, I don't know how a good waveform looks. Well, I just did automotive waveform libraries. Obviously not diesel because there ain't a whole hock of a lot of diesel ones out there. But we could try that. But in this case, there you could see various different uh, websites. And I hope you can all see what I'm seeing. You can all see my... Uh, my desktop here looking at the Google search I just did. And I just clicked on these guys right here. And in this case, you're going to see that they have many different style waveforms and sample waveforms you can look at. So in this case, I do recommend taking a class on, on lab scopes and understand basic lab scopes. But in this case, though, once you're looking for waveforms, you're going to see the different waveform libraries that are out there. So therefore, take advantage uh, what's out there for um, waveform libraries because it will really make your life a lot easier. So, or you can also be making your own waveform libraries. In other words, you're going to make your own stuff there. And in this case, it'll make you a lot smarter. So, you know, it, it's a question of you taking interest and in oops, look and actually knowing what you're looking at there. So therefore, definitely take a look at your voltage and time there on the lab scope so you know we were playing when i was on the road we were playing on looking at an lly injector here and here we can interpret and jim wilson did a great presentation he's going to do more later on for me but in this case uh, talking about what exactly is going on so we need to understand the dynamics of what's going on in the solenoid the solenoid you know it's going to be charged up so therefore we're going to have a given voltage and we're going to have that control of that current going there we're going to see that those on and off oscillations right there. So again, we need to understand what's going on. Obviously, I don't have enough time to go into this, but what I'm just trying to tell you is that it is very important for you to grasp what a lab scope is doing. But for starters, we can just look at regular analog voltages and it's as easy as positive going to the signal wire and ground going to any known good ground on the truck. So, but again, you're measuring voltage and time. So we'll definitely get more presentations involved with that. For you guys to understand that so all righty so hopefully i gave you some key tips on electrical fundamentals i'm not going to sit here and lie to you that my motive is to get you interested in getting electrical training yes i do do electrical training but we're trying to develop actually we do have it almost it's done where i'm going to be doing some online electrical classes so if that interests you let me know but in this case we appreciate lucas sponsoring this to make you understand that even some of the basic stuff about relays. And if you don't know relays or you don't understand coil and the Watts formula, Ohm's formula, series circuits and all that other stuff, you know, it's, you got to learn to it. Not to mention, you know, we have a big section about talking about meters. You know, this fluke meter has something what we call min-max mode. You know, we use min-max quite a bit in in-depth diagnosis where it actually records every 300 milliseconds. It actually takes a recording of a circuit to see if it actually is dropped going high or going low the voltage you can see what the minimum was the average is so you know i would say that probably uh, you're using less than 30 percent or 40 percent of the capacity of the meter there's more that the meter can do that maybe you don't know not to mention you know testing other stuff there too such as capacitors and so on so all right i'm just about out of time erica are you out there I am five here. Minutes five then. minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minutes for, for some questions here. Um, okay, so I don't know if you saw this. It says James Wilson, pick minimum, maximum. I think you were talking about the meter. 
He just answered that? He just asked that? Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about pink pigment max. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, well, any, another any question. questions, guys? Yeah, feel free to put up questions there. So. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, well, this is more for, for, for me, actually. Uh, is there a possibility to have any webinar in Spanish? So, yeah. I mean, yes. if we have the audience and if uh, uh, people are interested, I think we can, we know, we can also plan for, for, for the North American market in Spanish. I know we do some for the Latin American, and we can always plan with Tony uh, again for that that market. But if we have people interested in this area, uh, send me an email, and and we'll definitely look into that. And there's your email right there on the screen. Yes. <laughs> in case you don't get it by, uh, I mean, everybody gets the newsletters with my my name, so uh, you sure have it. Okay, so you do get some comments here. Uh, good course, muy bueno. <laughs> okay, thank you. Very good. Um, yeah, get some electrical training, like I said, so. Yes, uh, and I mean, uh, if you need also Tony's uh, email, uh, let me know if you need more information on any of the courses that he's given again on the electrical or any other that you've uh, seen. Also, since you had attended, you will be getting an email with the link for this uh, webinar. So you can go through it again if you need to, if you have any more questions. And also you can look at a YouTube channel and all of the videos or previous webinars are uploaded there as well, in case uh, you wanna go back and see anything. Um, I don't see any more questions, Tony, so. Well, remember. everybody just commenting. Thank you and thank yep. you for, uh, for that. Yep. So remember, what are we measuring in lab scope? Voltage and time. In this <laughs> case, what is voltage? It's the pressure. What is amperage? That is what's moving through the wire. That is current flow, right? What did I tell you was the maximum amperage that most meters measure? No more than 10 amps, okay? So therefore, how do we measure high amperage circuits? We use a an inductive meter. So therefore, definitely want to do know that stuff. So yeah, definitely want to know those electrical principles. And, and if, if you need to wake up, guys, and because like I said at the beginning of this webinar was what is the hardest selling class for us as training providers is electrical. But what is the most needed? Electrical. So therefore, look at where we're at today. You don't want to get back. And let me tell you, you know, I'm, I'm working with other instructors right now. I'm talking to instructors too, you know, and, and hybrid and the EV training is going on. But if you don't know the basics of electrical DC circuits, you're going to be way lost. So in this case, you don't want to get behind. Quit postponing the inevitable because tell me, like I said already, what is not computer controlled on today's vehicle? So no electrical. All right, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, we'll be seeing you in the next one. And we hope... Uh... Everybody will, will be joining us again. Look out for that email with the new date and the new topic. And well, that's it. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.